Uh, last time we had uh, a severe network problem. This problem is solved. So, um, and uh, that means um, I will now uh, finish this little section which we started about sequences and then switch over to Mathematica, give a Mathematica introduction and yeah, depending on how much time is left I will switch back um, and continue with uh, series. Is that okay for you? Okay. So, yeah, let's continue. I mean, we, we looked at sequences. Uh, we had, um, yeah, we especially we discussed this definition of convergence of a sequence. Um, and I explained it um, with this figure. And I also told you that this is pretty important especially when we do numerics and when we talk about uh, numerical algorithms. For example, algorithms for solving nonlinear equations or al algorithms for solving differential equations or numerical integration. I mean, almost always in numerics we have the question of whether an iterative algorithm converges or not. And therefore, you should know what convergence of a sequence means. We also will need it in some proofs. So this is really important. Are there any questions about this? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, then we looked at two nice properties of sequences. And yeah, this is where we stopped last time. So now let's continue. Here, here we have some, um, some more nice properties. I mean, it's, we could call this the kind of linear properties um, for limits of sequences. So the limit for, of a sum of two sequences is equal to the sum of the limits of these two sequences. Huh? Um, and if you multiply a sequence with a constant factor, then the limit is a constant factor times the limit. Um, the same if you multiply two sequences or if you have the ratio of two sequences. So you see, with sequences we have an easy life when we combine two sequences by addition or multiplication. Okay, yeah, and uh, yeah, now we, we look at an example. We look at this particular sequence, which is pretty nice, and we will prove that this sequence converges. Yeah, I mean, um, let's just first look at uh, this sequence. Let's first take a sequence looking like 1 plus a to the power n for n towards infinity. Uh, um, so the limit for n towards infinity. What can you say about this? For, I mean, don't look at this sequence, look here. This is a constant A, so this makes it much easier than what we have over there. This is the easier case, that's why we start with this. You know, did I tell you about how to solve problems? One way to solve a, different, a difficult problem is first to simplify the problem and look at the simplified problem and maybe we can solve it and maybe that then helps us for the solution of the more difficult problem. Now this is a simplified problem. 
What can you say about the limit of this sequence? Yes, very good. It depends on the value of a. Let's take a equals zero. What is the limit? One. One. That's easy, everybody sees it, nice. And now let's take a positive a. Well, the answer is Greece. That's what happens in Greece currently. Huh? I mean, they have to pay the interest for their uh, credits. And uh, I mean, if you have, let's say, for example, A equal uh, 0 0.03, and then we have 1.03 to the power n. Huh? So this is the amount of money here, the one, and this is the interest they have to pay every year. Huh? And that's the problem they have because this increases exponentially. So what is the limit of this guy? Infinity. And that's the reason why our capitalistic financial system does not work because this planet on which we live is finite. We do not have infinite resources and that's why such exponential functions, I mean, they are, they're okay for the first few years. But every 70 to 80 years, look at the history, we definitely have a financial crash. The last financial crash was, the last really hard in Germany was 1932. That's 80 years ago. Um, so it's now time for the next crash, and it will come. Uh, maybe not this year, maybe next year. It's all okay. Okay, let's go back to this. I'm sorry, so th this was actually not intended, but uh, I mean, when we talk about exponential functions, you want to see real world examples. And we do have one, not only in Greece, all over the world. It's in the United States, the same problem. Um, and in Germany in a few years too. Okay, now there is no limit if A is greater than zero. Now what if A is negative? It, it diverges. It diverges. It diverges. Um, it depends. It depends. I mean, we, if we have negative A, we have to look a little bit closer. Yeah, so it depends on whether A is between 0 and minus 1 or between minus 1 and minus infinity. If it's between <coughs> minus 1 and minus infinity, I mean, for minus one, we have zero. Yeah, so we should actually talk about between minus two and minus infinity, then um, it diverges again. Yeah? Um, the interesting region is for a between zero and minus one. Yeah? What is the limit then? Because then we, we have a definite limit. Zero. The limit is zero. Yeah. Okay, so you see we have uh, a couple of different limits. Zero, one, and infinity and minus infinity. Uh, whereas infinity and minus infinity are not really limits. Huh? Uh, I mean, this is when we call a sequence uh, divergent. Huh? Okay, um, but you see, as soon as this A here is positive, then the sequence diverges. Um, if it's a positive constant. And now look at this here. Here, this um, 
term we add to 1 is positive 2. But the interesting thing is it's not constant. It is getting smaller and smaller the bigger, a, uh, the bigger n is. Huh? For n towards infinity, this, this term converges to 0. Huh? So what we add goes to 0, but the exponent is getting bigger and bigger. And the question is, what happens? So three things may happen. First, it is the limit is maybe 1. No, it can't be 1. Or can it be 1? Oh, yes, it could be. Yeah, it could be 1. Second is it could be infinity. Yeah, that's the two. Uh, no, and third is it might be something in between. Limit may be 2 or 15 or 500. And that's the question. But, I mean, what, what to do next in order to know it a little bit better? We just look at such a table. So we take different n, and if we look at this, this looks like it converges. For n equal 10,000, we have 2.7181. And uh, it is actually true that the limit of this sequence is equal to the Euler number, E. And now we will prove that this uh, sequence converges. Of course, I already told you that even if you take very high n here, and it looks like the decimal places are getting fixed, there is no more change. Even then, you can't be sure that there is convergence. Huh? Oh, let me give you an, uh, an example. Yeah. So, um, yeah, maybe we just look into Mathematica a little bit. Um, we use Mathematica now. Yeah? So we compute the log. The, the log here actually is the natural logarithm of uh, 10, for example. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, if I ask Mathematica, what's the log of 10? You see, the answer is log 10. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? I could, uh, I could even ask, what's the square root of 10? And it would answer me, it's the square root of 10. We had this question uh, last time. Why is this answer? Because this is the correct answer. Huh? If I want to know the log of 10 to five decimal places, this is not correct, it's just an approximation. So by default, Mathematica always gives me correct answers, which is nice, isn't it? Okay, so if I want an incorrect answer, then I should ask n of log of 10. Because this n means I want to know a numeric uh, a floating point number as an answer. And now we get um, 2.3 something. Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, what, what, what did I want to show you? Yeah, I was talking about convergence and I wanted to give you um, a sequence where we have yeah okay now let's look at uh, n of log of um, one million okay and now let's do the same thing with uh, n plus 1. And what do we get? The same thing. Yeah? I mean, we could look at this even closer. We could do it with more decimal places. Um, 
If I say comma 20, then we get the result on 20 decimal places. Okay, and now we do the same thing uh, for the second number. And it's the same even on 20 decimal. Maybe we, should, we would need 50 decimal places, I don't know. Um, and then we would see a difference. Oh, it's not the same, is it? Oh, that's interesting. Here the last few are the same, but in the middle it is... Yeah, here we have a 1 instead of a 0. Isn't that funny? So many similar parts here. <laughs> oh, that might be a subject for a master thesis. Huh? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's let's look. Where where do we have the difference? It's here in the in the one, two, three, four, five, six. Ten to the power minus six is the difference here between these two guys. Huh? Um, and now, yeah, and now let's take the next. Um, so even n plus 2 now. And what do we get? So here the difference is 1 in this position. Yeah, it's almost exactly 1. And here it's almost exactly 1, 2. Oh, that's interesting. So this looks really funny, doesn't it? Yeah. But I mean, we, we, would, we would now have to look at a longer tabular with maybe uh, 100 different ends. And then you would see, you would see that the delta, which is the difference, the, di uh, the yeah, the, the difference between these two and these two, is getting smaller and smaller. But this does not tell you that the sequence converges huh? for n towards infinity. You all know that the logarithm um, is unbounded. I mean, the graph of the logarithm looks like that. Huh? So the slope is getting uh, more and more flat but it, it, uh, the function is unbounded, so it crosses any limit. So be careful when you watch sequences and you look at them and you, you get the impression, okay, the deltas are getting smaller and smaller, that does not help you. Huh? This, uh, I mean, you cannot conclude from this that the sequence converges, that's the point. Okay, yeah, that's nice. So we, we learned a little bit about Mathematica already. And um, so, and from this we cannot conclude that our sequence uh, converges. I mean, we can hope, but that's all we can, uh, can learn from this. Okay, so now um, in the first step, we p I mean, we will now use, we will use this theorem. Uh, that says if a sequence is bounded and monotonic, then it converges. And we will prove that this sequence is bounded first, and second, we will prove that it's uh, monotonic. Okay, I mean, it's not really hard to prove that it is bounded. So here we have the formula for our sequence, and now we use the binomial theorem. Huh? Um, I hope you all know the binomial theorem. Uh, yeah, what is it? What is the binomial theorem? <coughs> it gives us a formula for binomes, like um, what is it? Yeah, a plus b to the power n. Huh? There is a summation formula. Um, uh, do I get it by heart? Let me see.
the sum over i equals zero to n um, a to the power i times b to the power um, n minus i times times n over i. I'm pretty sure this is the formula. Huh? For, for small n, you all know it. For n equal 2, we have a plus b to the power 2 is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Huh? And this is it for n. So we need the binomial coefficients and then the combination of powers of a and b. And that's what we applied here. Look, we have such a sum to the power n. Yeah? I mean, here, of course, for a fixed n. We are not talking about the limit for n towards infinity. We take a fixed n. Yeah? Maybe n equal 2. And then it starts with uh, one, yeah, Look, the first, in the first uh, term in this sum is a to the power 0, uh, which is 1, times n over 0, which is 1 either. So we get, we get a 1 here. Huh? And then we get um, n, this n, is n over 1 uh, times 1 over n, which is the b. Uh, yeah, so we, yeah, we, there is in the second term we have, oh, we should actually uh, put it like that. I mean, it comes to the same result n minus i times b to the power i. It's the same result because these binomial coefficients are symmetric. Uh? Symmetric with respect to i equals 0 and n. Uh? Okay, so if I take, uh, that's actually what we use here. So this is the second term. We have n over 1, which is n times a to the power n minus 1. Uh, this is 1 uh, times 1 over n to the power 1. Yeah? And then in the second term, this is the second binomial coefficient times 1 over n squared. And these powers of 1, they always result in 1. Okay, then the second term, the third binomial coefficient times 1 over n uh, to the third, and so on. And the last, the very last term, it has as a coefficient n over n which is 1. Yeah? And then uh, 1 over n to the power n. Okay, so this is clear up to now? Is it? Now, how do we get to the next line? Yes, let's look here. Um, so I hope that now this pen is working. It's always the same thing. When I try it uh, at home, it works. I'm sorry. Someone should explain me what happens. Maybe it's this lecture room? I don't know. Um, okay. What we do now is I take this n squared. Look here on the denominator, uh, on the enumerator, we have uh, a product of n times n minus 1. And I divide this n by one of these two n's here and I divide the n minus 1 by the other guy. Yeah? And uh, is that what, it, what I do? 
No, we, uh, uh, the easier th uh, view is we multiply it out, we get n squared minus n, and then n squared divided by n squared is 1, and n divided by n squared is 1 over n. Okay, so that's what we get here. And here we do the same uh, game again. We take... Yeah, so we divide this n by the first of these n here, which gives a 1. Then we divide this by the next n, which gives 1 minus 1 over n. Then we divide this by n, which gives 1 minus 2 over n. Okay? And we do this, I mean, look, the, the point is, the number of factors we have here in the enumerator is the same as the power we have in the denominator. Huh? So each of these factors can be divided by one of these n here. Huh? And that's what we do in all our terms. Yeah. And in the last term, let me see. Oh, that's interesting. How do we get this last term from this here? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't see this at the moment. But this, this term must be 1 over n to the power n. Maybe we can write it down on the blackboard. So we have 1 over n factorial times. And now we write this as n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus n minus 1 divided by n to the power n. Is this the same? If we divide this by n, we get n minus 1 over n, n minus 2 over n. No, 1 minus 1 over n, 1 minus 2 over n. Yes. So this is the same as what we have here in the last term. And now, <coughs> okay, so this guy here is one. Okay? So what we have here is n factorial but one n is missing. N minus one factorial. Yeah, this is n minus one factorial. Yeah. But it should be n factorial. And then everything would be okay. If we divide this by n, we get 1 minus 1 over n. Ah, yeah, okay. Um, so this is n minus 1 factorial divided by n factorial times 1 over n to the power n. Oh, oh let me see. Ah! Maybe this is not correct. 
how many terms do we have? Oh, we have n minus 1 terms here. So this must be n to the power n minus 1 here. Okay? Um, and yeah, and then we can, I mean, we can multiply by n here and by n here and then we get n factorial over n factorial and this is 1 over n to the power n. Okay? Okay, so now we have shown that this last term here is the same as this. Okay, um, now, yeah, if we look at this factor here, this factor is definitely smaller than 1. Okay, how about this factor? It's even smaller. And this factor too. All these factors with the, the, the parentheses terms, they are all smaller than 1. And therefore, we can um, take as an upper bound for this right hand side, we can take this. We can just, um, um, as an upper bound for this, we use 1. So we get 1 half here. And we get 1 over 2 times 3 times 1 as an upper bound for this and so on. Okay. So this right hand side is smaller than what we have here. And now we do an even, uh, um, even rougher estimate. Look at this. 1 over 2 times 3. This, of course, is smaller than 1 over 2 times 2. Huh? Because in the denominator, if we replace the 3 by a 2, then the whole term here is smaller than what we have here. And in the next term, we have 1 over 2 times 3 times 4. And then, of course, this is smaller than... 1 over 2 times 2 times 2, 2 to the power 3, which is 8, and so on. And this, of course, n factorial is smaller than 2 to the power n. No, sorry, the other way. 1 over n factorial is smaller than 1 over 2 to the power n. Okay, so we get the next um, estimate. So this is bigger than this. And now, um, we extend, uh, I mean, this is a series, a sum, a finite sum with n terms. And now we extend this sum towards infinity. So we take the infinite sum. We take all terms 1 over uh, 2 to the power n plus 1 plus 1 over 2 to the power n plus 2 up to infinity. And then we have an infinite series. Huh? And if you look at this series, this is well known, it's the geometric series. Huh? But the geometric series starts from here. This is the first term with the power uh, 0. So we can, we can write this series as the sum over i equals 0 to infinity um, 1 over 2 to the power i. And for i equals 0, this is the first term and so on. So we have 1 plus this um, geometric series and the formula for the infinite geometric series is this guy here. Okay, and now if we Compute this, 1 minus a half is a half. The uh, reciprocal of this is 2, so we get 3. Okay? 
So we have now computed as an upper bound for this sequence 3. Huh? So the limit of um, Yeah, no, not, yeah, the limit of our sequence must be smaller than 3. Okay? If there is a limit. If there is a limit, then it must be smaller than 3. If there is no limit, it might oscillate or do something below 3. So we just showed it is bounded by 3. We have an upper bound of 3. An upper bound. Okay, what's missing is we have to show that our sequence is monotonic. Um, yes, and we can easily see this. I mean, what we computed here is a n, so the nth element of the sequence. And now, in order to show that it's monotonic, what do we need to show? Can someone give me the formula we have to prove now in order to show that the sequence is monotonic? Then it's even strictly monotonic, but that's what we will show. So we have to show that a n is smaller than a n plus 1. That's what we have to show. Okay, now let's take this third line here. In this line, if here we replace all the n's by n plus 1's, what happens? It becomes smaller? No, it becomes bigger. <coughs> Why don't we look at this first term? If we take n plus 1 here instead of n, then this denominator becomes bigger. So this ratio becomes smaller. And so what we sub subtract from 1 is smaller. So the whole term, this term, is bigger. And the same thing applies here on the second term and on all the terms. So all terms in this sum are bigger if we replace n by n plus 1. So if all terms in the sum are bigger, then of course the sum is bigger too. And then, uh, so we have shown that this holds. And that means we have shown our sequence is strictly monotonic, and uh, thus we have proven that the sequence converges. This is one out of many ways to prove that the sequence converges. Okay, yeah. And the limit of the sequence is the Euler number. I mean, we did not prove that this limit here is the Euler number. <coughs> this is different, we don't do this yet. Okay, yeah, and here it starts with a series, but now I would switch into um, the Mathematica introduction. Um, yes. So, um, this is the, uh, the manual um, for Mathematica, you see, it's pretty thick, but I mean, it's a, it's a really um, large software package. Of course, there are um, really nice online manuals, so you don't really need this, but uh, once you start programming with Mathematica, at least for me, 
it's quite convenient to have the manual uh, lying beside the computer, but it's up to you. Uh, on, uh, on the home page of the Wolfram company, so which is wolfram.com, there you find the online manuals, uh, I mean you find the online manual for the latest version of Mathematica, I guess it's version 7, um, but you also find the manuals for older versions, so if you use an older version you will find the manual there too. Okay, yeah. And um, Mathematica is a, a computer algebra system and the important feature here is um, the symbolic computation. Yeah? This is, uh, we talked about last week um, or last time um, about how this could be implemented for example by using uh, uh, implementation of tree structures for terms, pattern matching, formalisms and term rewriting. Of course this all is built into Mathematica um, and we can do symbolic computation and in particular what Mathematica does and uh, yeah you have seen it already or gotten a little bit of the taste it does exact computations. And this is very important to know. Whenever you do a, com a computation with Mathematica, by default Mathematica at least tries to give you the exact results. Uh? Um, yeah. let's, let's try something. Let's compute the square root of 5 uh, times the square root of, oh sorry, uh, of 2. Oh we get a nice symbol I've never seen. I don't know what that means but uh, if we just ignore, ignore it then you see the result is square root of 5 times square root of 2. Um, oh, we could try to use simplify because, I mean, you, you, would, uh, you would know how to simplify this term. What, what's the result? Uh, has anybody an idea how we could simplify this? If not, you better go home and uh, repeat high school. I can't believe it. You don't dare to, to, to tell me, yeah? Square root of 10, yeah. So you didn't dare, okay, that's fine. Um, if we use the per percent symbol in Mathematica, this is a reference to the result of the last command. So the last command was this, and if we say simplify this percent symbol, it means simplify the last expression. And hopefully we now get square root of 10. Oh no! So Mathematica seems to have no rules for this. That's kind of funny. It's really funny. But I'm, I mean this symbol is also... Uh, I don't know what happened here. Let's try it this way. Oh! That's interesting. Let's try it again. Um, Oh, uh, we need to do this. Five. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So it, it looks like here I pressed some uh, invisible key. 
look, uh, I mean, the, the result really is square root of 10, yeah? Um, I don't know what happened there. Okay. So you see, Mathematica always tries to do exact computation and give you the exact result. And if you want to know it in a decimal representation, you use this n symbol we know already. Huh? Okay, and you can do, for example, calculus. The capital D means differentiate something. We can use the sign of x um, squared um, divided by the cosine oh sorry um, of x and now of course we have to say which is the variable with respect to which we want to to do the uh, the differentiation um, and it is x and here we get the result yeah, and what is that minus the sine and so on two times cosine but what is this the cosine of x what does that prime mean the sine of x squared We can use input form. Oh, input form. And then maybe, aha, uh -huh. isn't that funny? So this actually is the first derivative of the cosine of x. Is this so difficult to, to uh, the, the first derivative of the cosine of x? <laughs> uh, that's funny what happens today. Okay, but let's continue. Let's do, let's integrate. Um, percent 16 this gives a reference to the output of command number 16 and of course we have to tell uh, the give the variable which is x hmm Okay, so that's interesting. So Mathematica is not able to find uh, the integral, the indefinite integral of this expression where we just computed the derivative. Yeah, but this is not too surprising. Why? Because you remember from school that integration always was more difficult than differentiation. And this is not only for you, this is a general truth. Differentiation of differentiable functions, as long as you can represent the function symbolically, if you have a symbolic expression, there are always rules to find the first derivative. But there are no rules for general symbolic expressions to find the integral of them. Yeah? There is no way, there is no algorithmic procedure. So sometimes it's easy, if it's a polynomial for example, it's easy. But in other cases it might even be impossible. Yeah? Um, I mean we know that in this case it is possible because uh, this is the function. Yeah? But maybe it's too hard for Mathematica to find the integral of this, uh, yeah. But uh, no, uh, let me see. Uh, but this surprises me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the command was correct. Gives the indefinite integral. 
Okay, so it really looks like that was too hard for Mathematica. So now, what else can we look at? Yes, uh, let, let's look at lists. A very important data structure in Mathematica is the list data structure. And uh, I mean, we can define a list L by assigning something like to it. And now we have this list L. Huh? Um, and this is the list data structure is the most important data structure. And it, I mean, could you please be a little bit more quiet? If you have a question, you know what's the communication protocol in this room? You don't know? You just raise your hand. You don't uh, say this question to your neighbor. You just raise your hand when you have a question and wait until you get admission to the communication bus here in this room. And one, uh, once you get the admission, then you can pose a question and hopefully uh, I will give you the answer. That's the protocol how it works in this room as long as I am here. I really don't like it if, uh, when many people speak during I give a lecture. I hate it. And then my lecture will not be so funny anymore. Okay? And you're welcome to ask all your questions at any time. Please ask your questions to me. Okay, so now we have defined the list and this list data structure is also used as the data structure for vectors. So we do linear algebra on these lists. Yeah? And for example, we can define a matrix M equal to, and a matrix of course is a two-dimensional, you can see it as a two-dimensional vector or a vector of vectors. Yeah? And we can, for example, say M is equal to, uh, the first element is L, comma, and then we take a second vector, like that. Oh, sorry, syntax error. Of course, we need to use the curly braces. Okay. I mean, that's, that doesn't look, really look like a matrix. Uh, table form. Uh, if we, with this command, uh, we can really see it as a matrix. Um, I mean, there is a simple reason that the default representation is not in this form, it's in that form, because this list data structure is, uh, is much more powerful than just representing vectors and matrices. Uh, for example, we can, uh, we can define something like D is equal to um, a list containing M and a list containing a list containing M, um, for example, this, yeah? And then this is D. And now if we use table form, then it's getting more difficult because now we have a three-dimensional list, yeah? which is a kind of a not two-dimensional, but three-dimensional matrix, and this matrix consists in one level of this and in the next level of this matrix. So, uh. and um, yeah, and this even is yeah. We can't do linear algebra with this because. Here we have a nested list uh, with this matrix inside here. Yeah? Or we can, for example, define a matrix, call it N equal, um, so the first vector may be 1, comma, like that. 
And I mean, we can try to do linear algebra with it, but it wouldn't work. Let's compute the inverse of that. Of the last. It wouldn't work. Argument at position one is not a non-empty square matrix. Oh yes, of course, inverse. Yeah. No, I mean, it's not a square matrix. So we should use something else like transpose. Oh, that's interesting. Transpose might even work. Percent, what was that? 25. Oh, it does not work, yeah. Because transpose is for linear algebra and it says the first two levels of the one-dimensional list cannot be transposed. Huh? Yeah. You can only transpose a matrix, but not an arbitrary list. Okay, so now let's do linear algebra a little bit. We can, of course, do transpose of our matrix M. And then we will get this. And we can do a multiplication of M transpose. Uh, sorry. M transpose, sorry. Uh, times and we use the dot M for um, matrix multiplication. So we have a, a 2 by 3 times a 3 by 2 matrix, which gives as a result a 3 by 3 matrix. Um, yeah. We may try to compute the inverse of th the last result because here we have now a quadratic matrix. What would you believe is the result? I mean, that's a hard question. I ask you for the inverse of a matrix. But the result is, sim is simple, so you, you, you don't need to know the inverse matrix because there is no inverse matrix. I mean, if we multiply, um, what did we multiply? Um, the transpose of M is this. Yeah? This is a matrix with uh, three columns and two rows. Yeah? And we multiply it by the transpose of it, this gives us a 3 by 3 matrix and this is, this is singular. Uh, this is singular. So we, we would have known it in advance. Um, yes. But another matrix may be non-singular. Let's try M times transpose. of M. Here we may be uh, lucky, okay. And then the inverse yeah, here we have an inverse. Oh yes, of course, we, have, we would have seen it here already. Because the two rows are linearly independent. Um, what else can we do in linear algebra? Oh, we can compute the null space, for example, of M. Oh, yeah. You see, I, um, I missed the convention of Mathematica and the convention for all the built-in commands is they start with a capital letter, but if the command consists of more than one word, then the beginning of all the words are capital letters too. So we should say null space like that of M. Okay, this is the null space of M. Um, 
Yeah, so that should be enough for a moment in, in linear algebra. What else should we look at? Look, let me look at the script. Um, yes. <coughs> Plotting, yeah. Yeah, we already tried to use the simplify command. This can always be used to simplify a uh, symbolic expression. And there is the opposite of simplify, it's called expand. This is when you have a complex expression and you want Mathematica to multiply it everything out and it just expand it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let's do some plotting. Plot of... Oh, let's... Why, why don't we look at the logarithm? Log of x um, and x from 0 to 10. You see, oh yeah, th th this is very important too. Um, and that's actually pretty nice in the syntax of Mathematica. There are three kinds of uh, brackets. There are the ordinary parentheses, and they are used for structuring expressions. Like if you have uh, oh, what we had before here in our computation, like, like this. And they are used only for this purpose. Then there are the square brackets, and they are only used as function arguments. Look here, there is this function null space and then a square bracket with all the arguments in them. And this is consistent all the time. And there are the curly braces which are for lists. So you see, for this plot command, the first argument is the function to be plotted and the second argument is a list. It's a list containing the name of the variable and then the, uh, the range of this variable. Range from 0 to 10. And we get this plot here. Which is not really surprising. Yes. Um, yeah. There is also a nice command called list plot. Um, which we apply to lists, I mean to data points. So we first have to produce a list. Um, yeah, let's say run uh, equal to table. Oh, we didn't use the table uh, command, which is very important too. Table of random of... Uh, 0, 0,5 I hope this is correct comma I, comma 1, comma uh, 50 yeah okay so the, this uh, run random function uh, gives me a random number huh? and I hope this was correct that would be a, a random number between 0 and 5 and the table command produces a table where the, 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 the running index of the table here it's, I call it i now, and it runs from 1 to 50. So let's see what happens. Oh, yeah, I'd, so I didn't use the random command correctly. So now we ask Mathematica, double question mark, random. Random gives a uniformly distributed, aha, uh -huh, okay, and I should say type and range. Okay, so we just use it without an argument and then uh, it uh, should be no problem. So, yeah. Random, 
um, comma i comma one comma fifty. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So now we have this table with random numbers, and now we can say list plot of ren. This is a one-dimensional list, so it's not a, a list of pairs of numbers. So in this case, Mathematica assumes this has number one, number two, and so on. Uh, and the list plot looks like that. So on this axis, you see it goes from 0 to 50. And here, it's something between 0 and 1. And we can, I mean, there are really many options for these plotting commands. Uh, so we could, for example, also say list plot of ran, comma, plot joint true. Oh. Yeah. And then we get like uh, a fiber curve. Um, so here this, this uh, arrow, this is new, it's used for options. So I use this list plot function, this is the list, the argument, and then I can add as many options as I want, separated by commas. Yeah? And um, I mean, I'm not really happy about the, uh, the handling of options by Mathematica because, I mean, it could be more convenient. And also, um, to know what are the option names, you always have to look into the manual or the online manual. Um, yeah, but the, the symbolic computation mechanism is quite nice in Mathematica. Okay, yeah. And now I have to talk about the um, equality symbols. I mean, of course, there is this equal sign, yeah? but there are three different equal signs. Yeah? Um, I mean, I can say a equal to 6, and then a is equal to 6, and if I say a uh, times a, it is uh, 36. Yeah? So this is, this is the ordinary assignment. Yeah? Assignment, as you know from any programming language, um, so this is not a logical equal, it's just an assignment. So that means in, the, in uh, this command just writes the number 6 into the storage cell associated to A. That's it. Um, and then we do have um, the lazy evaluation, which is this, A equals 7. And, I mean, you see a little difference. When we did this, then immediately I get as a return value 6. Now, when I did this, I got no immediate return value. That's why I call it lazy evaluation. So Mathematica does not do an assignment right now. It will use this number 7 when at some later stage I uh, use this variable a. So now let's look what happens if we say a times a now. Yeah, we get 49. Yeah? But the assignment was not made at that point. Yeah? And, that's, and that's pretty important. Yeah? Um, and of course we do have the logical, um, we may say a equal to 8, and we get false. Yeah? So this is just a question, is A equal to 8? And it's, that's not true. So you, you see we have three different kinds of equality. Um, and now let me continue with this lazy uh, assignment, um, because there is a nice application of this. Oh, before we go into that, I have to say that 
Mathematica is a functional language. Yeah? Of course, you all know procedural languages like C and Pascal and Fortran and whatever, um, or Java. You know object-oriented languages. There are logical languages like uh, Prolog. And there are functional languages like Lisp, Mathematica, and what else? Oh, I forgot. Okay, um, what is a functional language? It's a, f a language that, in the ideal case, only has functions and nothing else. Huh? I mean, uh, there are no uh, prog real programming languages that are ideal functional languages. An ideal functional languages language has no side effects, and that's the nice property. Uh, but no side effect means no global variables. And sometimes it's really convenient to use global variables, and that's why Mathematica is not in the strong sense of functional languages, language, but it has all the properties of functional languages, and if you don't like to, you don't have to use global variables. Yeah? Um, okay. What is a functional language? You can see in Mathematica there are no commands, like in other languages. Um, I mean, in, in, uh, like in C, there is a while command and an if and whatever. Huh? Here, there is no command. There are just functions. Huh? So, for example, a while loop, while is just a function. It's implemented as a function. While, um, uh, what, what shall we do? While true, um, yeah, what shall we do? A times A. Is that all? Yeah, I guess, I guess so. Okay, at least it looks like we, we started an infinite loop, yeah? <laughs> okay, we can interrupt it with control C and then we say A like abort. So it's all functions. It's all functions, there are only functions. Yeah? And now uh, the question is how do we program with this language? How can we define new functions? And for this purpose, we use our lazy assignment. Yeah? So we let's define um, the factorial function, which is pride, uh, quite easy. Let's call it fact. And then we take as an argument n. And now that's, uh, that's important. You have to use the underscore sign here. Yeah? in order to tell the system this is not an ordinary variable, this is just the parameter. This is the parameter of this new function factorial. So it's, I mean, when you learn programming, maybe you have heard the difference between formal parameters and actual parameters. Yeah? A formal parameter is just a name for a parameter and an actual parameter is when later on, at some point, I call this function factorial, then I put some parameter into it. This is the actual parameter, but the formal parameter, that's what, what I have to write here in the definition. So this, this is kind of a, a meta variable. And now we use our uh, lazy evaluation. Um, What's the factorial of n? Maybe we first do it at the blackboard. What's the factorial of n? Oh, we had it already. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Here we have the factorial of n. Now, what is this? How is it defined?
Ahora. Ahora. Yeah. So n times n minus one times one. Okay. I mean, yeah. So now we would. Yeah, we can we can do it. Product of I comma I comma um, one comma N. How about this? Now let's try it. Factorial of five. Oh, that looks good, doesn't it? So we have defined a function which is the factorial of n. But for a mathematician this is not really nice. I mean we need to write down such an explicit product uh, of length n but yeah I mean and for the computer scientist it, it, it's, it isn't nice either because the computer scientist of course would have written a for loop. Huh? But of course this is much more elegant than the for loop. We just say product. Huh? We can do the same thing of course with the sum and then this is called sum. Um, but for the mathematician all these variants are not nice either. For the mathematician and that's what I, why I was uh, happy when I saw this blackboard because I looked at this. You see that this is n factorial? And of course we write a recursive definition. So factorial of n, we give a new definition, is factorial of n minus 1 times n. How about this? Isn't that nice? Now let's do factorial of 5 again. What would be the result? 120? Hopefully. No. We get a stack overflow. Of course. I mean we have a recursive program here but with no termination condition. So now let's put the termination condition factorial of 1 um, equal to 1. And now we can say fact of 5. And it works. So, I mean you see recursive programming in Mathematica is quite easy. You don't even need such if-then-else constructions like you would need it in, in C. You just, we just say factorial of n is recursively defined in this way and I mean of course if you do this in the mathematics lecture if you just tell your students uh, um, n factorial is equal to n minus 1 factorial times n then your students should ask, oh, but this is not enough. What is factorial of 1? You have to define it. Yeah? So, um, so we could, uh, we would uh, typically do it like that. Um, if n is greater than 1 and is 1 if n equal 1. Yeah? Okay, so now this is the way how you can define functions. Um, okay, um, I mean this is uh, uh, still a little bit dirty because you may want when you when you write programs you want local variables uh, which may be hidden from from the outside world and when you when you want to, when you do this then you have to define a module module and of course a module is a function module um, no, oh no sorry um, 
Um, we define our factorial again. Yeah. And now we use the module command, module. And now we have a list of uh, local variables. Um, let's use a variable called TMP. Um, you see this function module, the function module has two arguments. First argument is the list of local variables. You see, we have a list with one element. And second variable is the whole program. So now we can continue writing the program. Um, what shall we do? Oh, we could, for example, say, um, I mean, it's not really smart, but it, it should work. TMP is equal to factorial of um, n minus 1. Um, no, this is not good. What, what, are, what, do, what did we miss? I mean, if we do it in this classical way, we need an if. If n is equal to 1, uh, then um, TMP is um, no, we return one. Yeah. Otherwise, we do the recursive uh, call factorial of n minus one. Oh yes, and we don't need a, a temporary variable anymore. I mean, that would work, but we don't need a temporary variable. Okay, so we don't need it. That should be correct. Oh, did we, yeah, we are missing one square bracket. Oh, factorial of six is equal to one. Oh yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. What was what was our fault? What was our fault? We assign one to n. No, we do not assign. This is the logical equal. So we test whether n is equal to one. If n is equal to one, then we return one. Otherwise, we return the factorial of n minus 1. So, w but what did we miss? Yeah? Uh, we have to multiply n to the recursive call. Yeah, that's what we have to. Okay, so we have to multiply this with n, and now it should work. Oops. Oh, we have one one uh, bracket too much. Is that true? Yeah, yes, it's true. Okay, yeah, that looks good. Okay, so we have defined a little module now. Oh, and uh, oh, but we, uh, this module has only one, uh, one statement. I mean, if you do sequential programming, which is possible, of course, then you, you do the same thing you do in C. You separate your uh, single commands by a semicolon. What's quite important is that um, if you have a semicolon after your last command, then let's try this. I mean, the last command is the first command here, of course. And if we put a semicolon here, then, um, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. 
Um, and now, if we now compute the factorial Oh, that's interesting. Why did we, why didn't we get the semicolon here? <coughs> okay, now we have the semicolon, something went wrong before. And now factorial of six, we get no result. Why do we get no result if we put such a semicolon here? I mean, this is similar to all programming languages. The semicolon separates one command from the next. So this is used to separate this command from an empty command coming after the semicolon. And Mathematica gives us a return value, the return value of the last command in your program. Now if the last command of your program is an empty command, then you get no return value. So be careful uh, not to put a semicolon after your last command if you want to have this as the return value. If you do not want to have a return value, then just put a semicolon at the end. Okay, so now we also talked about programming with Mathematica. And I tried to show you the easiest way of programming, which is, I mean, whenever it's possible, just write down definitions. If you look at the mathematics script, uh, especially in the numerics chapter, I often give you an algorithm, some formulas, and you can in Mathematica write down these formulas very in a very straightforward manner. Yeah? So sometimes you just write down the, the formula. Look, look what we did when we defined our factorial. What, where, where was it? Um, yeah, it was here. Look this. This is um, this is exactly as if I write n factorial is equal to n minus 1 factorial times n. Huh? This is exactly uh, what we had here. Huh? And then, of course, we, we have to give this termination condition, um, which we did here. Factorial of 1 is equal to 1. Huh? Um, so this is the, the most elegant way to program in Mathematica. It is often not the most efficient way, uh, so you really have to find a trade-off. And also when you do these programming examples, you have to be aware all the time that Mathematica tries to give you an exact result. Huh? Um, and this is, this may be extremely resource consuming. Uh, um, let, me, let me give you an example, um, as a last example before we stop. Yeah. Um, table of, um, What is it? Um, no, let's do a for loop. For i equal um, zero, um, i plus uh, no, i. Uh, less than uh, 100 comma i plus plus comma and now let's write the program um, x is equal to x squared and 
and that's it. Why don't why doesn't it do anything? Oh, uh, let's say x is equal to two initially, and then we we did a typing error here. We need to use the the lowercase x squared. Yeah. Oh uh, yes, uh, sorry. We don't. We, of course, this is the initialization here. We don't do the the logical uh, equality. And now, why doesn't this work? This is the capital X again. Sorry. X squared. Is this the lowercase now? No. X squared. Why don't we get a return value? Sorry. Okay, let's try it again. Semicolon print x. Did he? It is doch, das ist doch oben. Ach, wir haben groß x. Ja, ja, genau. Okay. Danke. Okay. Oh yeah, we, we at least we get powers of x. Um, but now let's put x equal 2 and try this thing again. And now you will see what happens. You see what happens? Your computer is extremely busy and it's working and working and it may never stop. Why? What's the problem? And you will get this problem. You can be sure you will get this problem and you will have no idea what happens unless you put the print statement into your program. Without the print statement we, we would just wait. And now we see uh, lots of numbers. Actually, not so many numbers, but quite big numbers. Look at this number. This is one number all the time. It's a really big number, so it costs you a couple of lines to write down this number. Why do we get such a big number? I mean, just, yeah, we get the next number now. I mean, these are the prints of our squares. And what happens if you do 2 times 2? It's 4. 4 times 4 is 16. 16 times 16 is 256. And the, the fact is that the length of your number, the number of places you have in your number, doubles with each multiplication you do. And we did 100 multiplication, so the length of our number is going to increase by a factor of 2 to the power 100. And this is quite a large number. So this is approximately 10 to the power 30. So if this computation finally stops, then the length of the output number by the print statement has so many uh, places. Uh? So the length of the number is like that and this is by far larger than any storage in this computer. So there is no chance that this computation will ever terminate. If we, if we would have done this using, um, using uh, floating point calculations, then it would have worked without any problem then we would get something like uh, 10 to the power 30 
and this can easily be written down and it's, this easily fits into the storage but it's no longer uh, correct. So, um, what was the, the factorial? Yeah, okay, so this was our factorial definition. Oh no, no, we didn't give it a name this last program. Okay, so what you, what you, what you can do to avoid these exact calculations is there are two possibilities. First is you use this n function. n of something gives you the decimal representation or you just multiply the result by 1.0. As soon as you use in a computation such a decimal point number, a floating point number, then the result will also be a floating point number and you no longer have this problem. So you really have to decide whether you want to have exact computation, then you don't use decimal numbers, um, and then everything is exact, but this can be very, very resource consuming, or you do numeric computation, then you use such a decimal number, um, but then everything is inexact. These are the two possibilities. I mean, if you do programming in C, you only have one of these two possibilities, but here you have to decide. Okay, yeah, and next time, Richard Schubeck will give you a similar in, uh, introduction into Octave, which is the, the freeware open source variant of MATLAB. Thank you.